I'm just going to give a minute for transition. Thank you, Jesus, huh? I said, thank you, Jesus. Woo! Yes, he is. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I've got to gather myself. I need a minute. You know what? Let's just give the Lord a round of applause. Amen? A clap offering this morning. He's good. I said he's good. Woo! All the time. I'm going to have to get me a fresh Kleenex. That's for sure. Take two, they're small. <laughs> I love you guys too. I love you so much. God is good. Look around. God is good. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm going to bounce off of uh, Pastor Rose's message last week. Thank you, Pastor Rose. Fantastic message. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear into it a little bit. Well, no. I mean, it's good. Good tear into it. Expand. I don't mean to. Yes, yes. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Expand. <laughs> uh, oh, well. So it was all about planting last week, right? Seed and planting. So ironically, last week, I spent the week digging up plants and transplanting them. Okay? So the, the, the cool part of this story here is I had a neighbor move in. Fantastic guy. Really nice. But there was this woods that separated our houses. And he's like, I've got young kids. I need to cut these woods down. I'm like, ugh. Being the good neighbor, I wanted to help him. So I broke out my chainsaw, and we start cutting this 20-foot of woods between our homes down. At the time, I had this row planted. They're called the Rows of Sharon. And I had an abundance of them planted down my property line. They're beautiful. Now, the cool part of the story, when we cut the woods down, we kind of got the houses surveyed. And here, <laughs> I owned most of those woods. I thought they were his. But the problem was the property line where I lined my beautiful plants were now in the middle of my yard. So I got to dig them up again. So a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, uh, Jessica and I, we, I, I was explaining to them how much I love these rows of Sharon, right? Yeah. And what I did was I, I went to their house and I removed them real delicately out of the ground. No, I reached down and I yanked them straight out the ground, okay? I probably got about 50 or 60 of them. I was pretty zealous. And I brought them home in the back of the car. Okay? <laughs> now listen. Y'all know I get distracted, right? No. I, get, I get distracted a little bit. So day three, my wife says to me, Hey, do you think you're going to plant those rows of Sharon? And I said, huh? She goes, yeah, they're in the back of the car still. I said, oh. We have this conversation. Should I plant them? Should I not plant them? Everybody's like, they're a hardy plant. They are. Right? They'll live through this. And I'm like, three days? And I'm like, well, why not a fourth? <laughs> By the time I pulled these plants... Out of the back of the car, they looked like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. They didn't have any leaves. 
they had one little root from where I ripped them out. But guess what I did? Yeah, you know, and listen, probably had I listened to her on day two or day three, you know, we wouldn't have had such a cool story, but I decided to be a blockhead. So we Charlie Browned it, right? So I take these, these rows of Sharon and I, yeah, little sticks, just little sticks. That's all they are at this point in time. And I, I put a lot of time into them. So what I do is I grab the shovel, I throw it in the ground, I wiggle. I didn't remove the grass. I didn't fertilize them. I, didn't, I mean, come on, they're going to die anyways. Right? And I figured I'd clump like four or five of them together. Because, you know, if four of them die, I still got one left. Right? I mean, let's play the odds. So I put these things in the ground all the way down the property line. I didn't really add water. I didn't really add fertilizer. I'm like, eh, if they live, they live. Right? So, next bloom, next season, next bloom, these things grow. None of them died. And matter of fact, they're like a foot and a half bigger than when I planted them. They start blooming these pretty flowers. And the neighbors come to me and he's like, dude, those are so pretty. I'm like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah they did, they wanted some. And, 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 and they come to me like, well, what did you do? I says, well, first thing you got to do is you got to leave them in the car for four days at 85 degrees. The second thing you got to do is don't water them, don't fertilize them, just shove, rip them out of the ground first and then shove them back in the ground. That's what you got to do. That's how you get these pretty plants, right? The, next day, the, neighbor, the neighbor down the street comes to me and goes, how did you get those to mix and match with the colors? Because there were some white ones and some purple ones all in these groups. So I looked it up on the intro net, right? We've got to go to the intro net. Got to Google it. They're more expensive if they have multiple colors. But since all of them live that I put in there, I had whites and purples all in the same bundle. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. See, here's what I did. I did that on purpose. No, I just figured they're all going to die. <laughs> but my point to you is this. How cool would it be if we were like these rows of Sharon? No matter what we go through, no matter what we face, we just live. We just live. You know, the Bible says this. It compares, in the Song of Solomon, Solomon compares Jesus to the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Now listen, it's not the same rose of Sharon, Okay. There was this valley called Sharon, and there were these pretty roses. But I'm just kind of using it as a segue, okay? Okay, it's cool. These rows of Sharon, man, they would not die. I did everything but cut them into pieces. And they just would not die. I want to be like these rows of Sharon. I want to blossom when it just doesn't seem like we can. I want to grow when it seems unlikely. Right? It might not be so bold. You've heard me say this before. I just want to live, love, and look like Jesus. Mm. But how? How can I live, love, and look like the Messiah. How do I have the resiliency of a rose of Sharon? I'm going to put a fancy word in front of you. Maybe not fancy, not too fancy. I normally don't do this, but this, it's been on my heart all morning. I had to write this in. I want you to say this word after me. Ready? Spiritual, Spiritual. 
formation. formation. I want you to say it again. Spiritual, Spiritual. Formation. formation. Spiritual formation is causing everything to form after the Spirit of God within you. Translation, the ability to live, love, and look like Jesus. See, here's, here's one thing we fail to realize. The Spirit of Christ is in me, yelling, crying out, Abba, Father. We're made of three parts, right? Spirit, soul, body. The Spirit... The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ that is within me is perfect. Amen. I'm going to say it again. It's perfect. Amen. Do you think it's immature? Do you think the Spirit of Christ within you is a baby? No. 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 Oh. So when our spirit leads our body and our soul where our mind, will, and emotions exist, will follow. I call this spiritual formation. Mm. Now this is a little Steveology here. Do you know what the problem with the church is today? Do you know what the problem with the Christian today is? It's immaturity. And I will pose this to you. Immaturity in the believer is the greatest obstacle to the gospel. We are called to grow. Mm. What do we got to do? We got to get the soul to follow the spirit in what we call formation. Amen, Pastor Steve. That's good stuff. Hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. Amen. So, <laughs> let's call this the process of growth. Now, Mark 4, 26 through 29. I'm going to focus on verse 28. But we're going to go 4, 26 to 29. He says, this is Jesus. Jesus says this. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Where is the kingdom of God? It's everywhere. It's the king's domain. It's heaven. It's earth. The king owns it all. Ooh. And a man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps and gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how. He does not know how that the seed grows. He does not know how the growth takes place. Yet it takes place. In verse 28. All by itself. Say all by itself. The soil produces grain. It's this word all by itself is where we get the word automatic. Automatically, automatically, all by itself. It grows. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. We need to understand something. God created this system of sowing and reaping. He created this thing called the miracle of the seed. I don't know how it grows. Scripture says it's a mystery. It's a mystery to me. I have no idea why my rose of Sharon grew. But they did, despite my best efforts. It grew. What do we know about the seed? The seed contains everything it needs to grow. It contains the power to grow. What is the seed? Say word. word. Do it again. Say word. word. The seed is the word of God. And if planted, it will grow. Now, what is the word of God? Take me to John 1, 1 and 14, please. 
Better question, who is the Word of God? Jesus. Ooh, here we go. I love this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Might I tell you something right now? In the beginning. In the, what does that mean, in the beginning? So in the beginning of us, the Word had already existed. See, a lot of us think that when the Bible was penned, that's when it was created. No, the word always was and always will be. This world will pass away and the word remains true. Verse 14, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one, the only Son. We need to understand something. The Word is Jesus. This is what needs to be planted so I can live, love, and look like him. Amen. Mm. So my question for you today is this. Will you let him grow in your life? Will you let him take root in your life? See, what do we know about the seed? What do we know about the word? What do we know about the word made flesh? What happens to the seed when something grows out of it? It dies. What did Jesus do for you? What did the word made flesh do for you? He hung on the middle tree for you and me. He died. But guess what? He rose again. Amen. Whoa. Grab hold of that. When the seed dies, new life begins. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to take you to the parable of the sower and the seed. Jesus teaches this in Mark, be Mark 4. He makes this, and, and, and before I read this passage to you, you need to understand something. Jesus says this in his teaching. This is the key to everything that I say. This is the key to the kingdom, the king's domain. This is the key. I want you to think like this for a minute. There was this stone that was discovered. It was called the Rosetta Stone. Yep. On this Rosetta Stone, there were three languages. One was a mystery. It was an Egyptian language called hieroglyphics. Yet, the other two languages were known languages. Therefore, we could translate the Rosetta Stone. We understood what hieroglyphics was saying now. I want you to think of this as the stone or as the key that unlocks the mystery of the kingdom in the Word of God. That's how important this message is. I'm going to start in Mark 4, verses 3 through 8. Listen. Listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. And still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, 60, and 100 times. We're going to see three players in this parable. First, the farmer who scatters Seed. Who's supposed to be get scattering seed? Anybody know who's supposed to be scattering seed? The disciples, baby. 
Anytime the word is heard, we're scattering seed. Amen? And guess what? All we do is scatter it because it's automatic. It will grow on its own. Mm. The seed contains all the power that is needed to grow. And I'm going to reiterate this point. Who is the seed? First Peter 1.23 says this. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Who is the imperishable seed? Jesus. He rose again, baby. See, the beauty of the imperishable seed is that it never dies and it can continue to be planted and planted and planted and planted and planted. Now, there's another player in the game. It's called the soil. Say soil. Soil represents our hearts. Now, if you went me a couple weeks ago, what is the heart? Oh, I think I heard it. No, I didn't. I was going to tell you anyways. I'm trying to make myself feel better. Yes, the heart is the soil. But what part of the three parts of us, what does the heart make up? The spirit and the soul. Those two parts make our heart. And we receive spiritual formation when the soul follows the spirit. The heart is both of these pieces put together. Now we're, we're going to address a few things here. Within the heart, there are four types of soil, four types of ground, okay? The wayside, the pathway, the stony ground, the ground that has thorns or weeds and a good ground. There are four parts to this. To me, there's this big misconception with this parable because we think this is indefinite place that you are. Most times when this parable is explained, there's four types of people, right? Those on the pathway, those in the stony ground, those who got weeds and thorns, and then those who got good ground. What I'm going to pose to you today, those are stages of your Christian walk. You're not stuck there. Are you with me? It's not somebody, oh, he's got... Hard ground, and there's nothing we can do. Ooh, growth is a process of maturity. Are you with me? Okay. Let's talk about the seed that falls on the path. Let's talk about the seed that falls on the wayside. For some people are like seed among the path where the word is sown. They hear it. And yet Satan comes and takes away the word that has been sown. It's the path. It's the walkway. Listen, what do we normally do with walkways and paths? Brother-in-law, when you got some place that people walk a lot, what do you put there? Concrete. That is a walkway. That is a path. So when the seed, the word of God, Jesus, the gospel, hits the hard ground, the walkway, the path, it's susceptible to the birds, which represent Satan. He's going to come and he's going to steal that seed. I love that kid. <laughs> One day she can be my greatest amener. Woo. Amen. <clears throat> but it's an extremely hard surface. 
And this is the only condition within the heart that Satan has access to the word. He can steal it. Do you know why? Because he can steal anything you don't seem to understand. If you have lack of understanding, guess what? It can be stolen. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 goes like this. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of of their thinking, the frivolous of the way they think. It's ungodly the way they think. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardening, hardening of their heart. Lack of spiritual formation. If you do not understand the word of God, you do not understand the imperishable seed, Jesus, it can be stolen from you. Listen, when I was sitting in kindergarten, two plus two was five to me until my teacher smacked me and said, hey, dummy, two plus two is four. I said, oh, she probably smacked me a few times. You know what I'm saying? We must understand the love of God. But guess what? That seed falls on the hard ground. Andrew Womack, one of my favorite speakers, he says this. We spend more time in the light of our TVs than we do in the light or the understanding of God's word. We spend more time in the light of our cell phones than we do in the presence of of Jesus. Woo, hard message today. I know. I know. The second type of soil is called the stony ground. Mark 4, 16 and 17. Other, others, like seed sown on rocky places, they hear the word and once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, say no root. The last only, excuse me, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Now listen. You need sun for growth. The sun is a good thing. But in the original part of this, it says what? The sun scorched. The plant, the seed, because of what? They had no roots. Mm. Listen, it takes time, and Pastor Rose talked on this. It takes time to build a root system. Right? Matthew 17, 20. Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a... You can say to the, move from here and there, and nothing, nothing will be impossible for you. Faith of a mustard seed. Mustard seed is the smallest seed in in the herbs that Jesus is referring to. And he goes on to say this, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when planted, It grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with big branches that birds can perch on. The smallest of all seeds grow into a large herb. Why? Roots. The deeper the root, the greater the tree. Are you with me? The question is this, how can a, a tree move a mountain? Now listen, I have been to Nelson Ledges. How many, how many Nelson Ledges rock climbers do we have? Back in the day, that was my favorite thing as a kid. And the best way up the side of the cliff was to find yourself a tree. 
they had grown in the crack. And the roots had gone all the way down to the bottom where the good soil was and continued. But guess what, man? I could run right up the side of those roots, grab onto that tree, and be on the next level in five minutes. Back in, back in the day. Not now. Back in the day. My point to you is this. Roots will split rocks. I don't know how many of you people love trees, but if you plant a tree by the foundation of your house, you will no longer have a foundation on your house. My brother-in-law has a good job because of people who plant trees by the house or driveways, right? So what happened to the seed that fell on the stony ground? Scripture says this, troubles, persecution, affliction, comes and the plant withers and dies for the word's sake is a direct translation for the word's sake but what does that even mean for the word's sake Mm. see when you've got trouble and you've got affliction and you got persecution, guess what? You focus. Look at COVID. We focused. And I will tell you this. The church grew. Amen. While COVID was, you know why? Because persecution came. And affliction came. And troubles came. And we focused on what really mattered. The seed. Woo! Mm. In this second soil, it's called the stony soil. There's rocks all through your heart. And these rocks block the root. From growing down into the good soil where revelation exists, understanding exists. Example. You always seem to always seem to pray with people, and this is just a generality. If this is you, I'm sorry, but I'm not. I come across people who, you know what, Pastor, we need uh, we need a home. Pastor, my, my car's broke down. Can I? Can you just agree with me? And we can pray that I get a car or I get this house or, or whatever, you know, my, my family needs. And I'm like, okay, man, I'm going to agree with you. We're going to pray. We're going to storm heaven. We're going to make some things happen here. A little while later, you know, I haven't received... My blessing, Pastor. What, what is going on? And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, let's, uh, let me ask some clarifying questions. First one starts like this. Do you give? Amen. Do you give? Amen. Well, Pastor, I need a house, so I need to save. That's not what I asked you. I said, do you give? Well, see, Pastor, the kids need braces. I didn't ask you the need. I asked you, do you give? Mm. Well, see, Pastor, you know, it's been rough these last couple of months because, you know, I haven't been able to give. You know, January was rough, and it kind of went through December. You know what I mean? It's rough between those months, you know. So you're asking me, To pray for you that you are blessed, pressed down, shaking together, running over. And you don't even follow the economy of God. What? Your prayers are fruitless and so are mine. You're not wasting my time. Are you with me? It's better to live on the 90 than the 100. Because God blesses the 90. You with me? 
But the problem is, when we don't have revelation, that stone blocks the roots from going down and grabbing that revelation. See, we know God can, but we don't have the spiritual formation to walk it out. Woo, it's good preaching right there. Verse 7. Other seeds fell among thorns. They grew up and choked the plant so that it did not bear grain. This, whoo, this is where the body of Christ is today. We receive the word of God. We endure troubles. We endure persecution. We get past the stony ground. Think about stages. We get past the stony ground. But then weeds grow up in our garden. And we fail to pull them. And we allow our thinking to be dominated by ungodly thoughts. I want you to think about this for a minute. Let's just use the the blessing of the house for an example, right? So let's say this person gets past the stony ground and they start giving and they're representing the heart of Jesus. They are looking and loving like Jesus would. God blesses them. You got this house. But guess what? Now we're more concerned with the blessing than the blesser. See, the church will grow in persecution, not in prosperity. Because we get concerned with all of our blessings. Our blessings seem to be more important than the one who gave them. Prosperity has damaged the church more than persecution ever did. Are you with me? And listen, God's economy is true. His word is true. If you give, he will bless you. And sometimes I think the world knows that better than we do. If you give, you are blessed. The reality is this. You're blessed to be a blessing, not to be consumed with the cares of this world. So if you've ever been frustrated with your ability to live, love, and look like Jesus, what are you reaping? What's the lifestyle? Are you betrayed by the deceitfulness of riches and pleasures? Oh, man. Scripture says this. The weeds and the thorns grow with the seed of Jesus. Okay, you with me? We need to take the weed killer and kill the weeds. And we need to walk in this thing called repentance. Say, repentance. Do you know what repentance really is? It's like taking a shovel and shoving it in the ground and pulling that bad seed out. So it doesn't bear fruit. So it doesn't choke the Jesus within you. Amen. That's what repentance does for us. It allows us to grab those seeds that are going to be weeds. And it allows us to pull them up out of the ground. Oh, man. I don't want any bad seed in my life. Amen. Because I want to look Love and just be like Jesus. That is the seed that we need. Verse 8. Still other seeds fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop. Some multiplying 30, 60, and 100 times. See, good ground just doesn't happen. It's got to be cultivated. The weeds got to be pulled. The stones got to be crushed and ripped out of the ground. It takes, whoo, Christian cuss word, work. I'm telling you. 
I'm telling you, it takes work. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. I know I preach a lot of grace to you, but the reality is this. If you want to look love and live like Jesus, you're going to have to work. See, this whole parable to me, and we can apply it to a lot of things. We can apply it to sowing and reaping and bringing souls in. We can apply it to the economy of God, giving so that things can be pressed down, shaken together, running over. But the reality to me is this. This is the way I see it. It's about fruit. What fruit do you know of which allows you to live, love, and look like Jesus. Oh, there it is. Pastor Rose, always so quick to the answer right there. Give him a chance, Pastor Rose. Give him a chance. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is, come on, say it with me, love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. These are the fruits of the Spirit. Oh, okay, here we go. Let's do this. Let's, uh, I'm going to call mercy music up, but I want, to, I want to explain something to you. And listen, first of all, let's qualify this. This is Steveism. Okay? I'm going out on a limb here. This is Steveism. Okay? 